<clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about um, something that's very uh, close and near and dear to my heart, which is the future of education. And to understand the future of education or to understand really the future of anything, we need to understand the role that technology is going to play in our future. And <clears throat> I've made a film about technology called Transcendent Man, about the life and ideas of Ray Kurzweil. This is a photo of myself and Ray at the premiere of our film at the Tribeca Film Festival. And Ray is a very interesting person. If you don't know who he is, I'll um, tell you he's a world's foremost inventor, futurist, and technologist. And he's the guy, he's been inducted into the Inventors Hall of Fame. Bill Clinton gave him the Medal of Technology. And he's the guy that Bill Gates goes to when he wants to understand what the future is going to be like in 5 or 10 or 15 years. And I know what you're thinking. Barry, we can't predict the future. But, and that's the conventional wisdom. But actually, we're finding that if it's analyzed as an information technology, we can actually accurately predict the future in some very amazing ways. So <clears throat> this is a screenshot from my fil film. And the big takeaway that Ray offers us is uh, his law of accelerating returns, which states that all technological progress is exponential. Technology is actually built upon earlier forms of technology. And so the whole progress of technology in the long, in the long run is exponential. And we really need to unhinge our thinking from this linear historical view to an exponential view, because the future is coming at us exponentially. If I counted linear, one, two, three, four, five, 30 steps later, I'm going to get to 30. If I count exponentially, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30 steps later, I'm going to get to a billion. It makes a big difference when we're going to look to how the future is going to play out. You can see that technology is also growing exponentially in other ways, for example, in adoption rates. If we look back to the Gutenberg printing press, for example, it took over 100 years for 25% of the European population to adopt that technology. Um, the telephone, the American telephone, only took 50 years. The internet took only 10 years. Other forms of new technologies like iPads and cell phones are coming online even quicker. Facebook and Twitter, of course, is being adopted globally even quicker still. So, uh, and a corollary to the law of accelerating returns is that as the price performance of these devices is going up, these technologies are actually getting smaller. So the computer that now fits inside my pocket um, actually used to fit in, in an entire building about this size when Ray actually uh, was learning about computers back at MIT. You needed special access to get at that computer. It cost tens of millions of dollars. This computer is a billion times more powerful in price performance in terms of constant dollars. We'll make that same jump again in the next 25 years, and the computers will become so small that they'll actually fit inside of a red blood cell. They'll be so small you can't see them with the naked eye. We'll ingest them. They'll grow exponentially. They'll keep us healthy and clean from the inside. They'll eventually go inside our brains, but that's another speech. Uh, <laughs> this is my daughter, Lauren, with her iPad. And she's very reluctant to give it up. She's so kind of intimately um, merged with it already. Um, and she does a lot of education on it already as well. But so I, I think the time has come that uh, we have, the, we have the, the power and the ability to have uh, every student paired with a computer tablet. And these names, computer tablets, iPhones, are really a bit of a misnomer. They really ought to be called gateways to all of human knowledge because that's really what they represent. They allow us with a few keystrokes to access all of human knowledge. Another powerful technology that's coming online is AI. And there's really nothing artificial about intelligence. It's going to make itself available wherever and however it can. And it is the most powerful force in the universe. So as it's starting to come online, it's been very narrow for a number of decades, but it's coming on strong now. And we see a lot of people don't know we have Google cars driving around California without drivers that have driven 140,000 miles without hitting a pedestrian and, or breaking any laws. We know famously IBM's Watson has actually recently beat Ken Jennings, the Jeopardy champion, um, not at pure logic, 
but it actually the cutting edge of our human intelligence, which is our emotional intelligence. In other words, getting the joke, getting the pun, getting the metaphor, understanding these very sophisticated questions that you have to understand to play and actually beat in uh, Jeopardy. We also see Apple's new virtual assistant theory just coming on this previous last couple weeks. So this technology, again, is shrinking into our pockets. We're merging with it. And as a corollary, by the way, Siri was another invention that uh, Ray Kurzweil invented in a previous company that Apple had bought. Um, so what's going to happen with these new AIs tethered to the cloud? Well, we're going to usher in a new paradigm of education. And as we're offloading already all our facts, all our memories, all our photographs, all our contacts to these devices, we can change the way that we actually start to educate our children. We don't have to teach them the same uh, wrote facts, mathematics, and dates. We can start to teach them critical thinking. We can teach kids to think about thinking and think about what's important. We can teach entrepreneurism in the classical sense of the word, to actually work together in small groups and to manage resources. And it's no wonder that a couple people working together, two or three people working together on a $1,000 laptop, uh, like Larry Page or Sergey Brin or Mark Zuckerberg, have changed the world more than the next 100 million people combined. So my child, Lauren, is entering uh, kindergarten this year. She's going to go through her K through 12 and then hopefully five years of college. And where is the world going to be when she gets out? Well, it's going to be an entirely radically transformed place. And uh, uh, industries are changing. Technology is highly disruptive. Uh, to give you an example, if you wanted to send a book or a CD or a movie just 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you needed to put that physical object in a box and ship it to somebody. Today, you can attach it as an email file, an information file. And so those, uh, to anyone in the world that has internet access, and so those industries, the publishing industry, the music industry, the movie industry, have actually undergone enormous disruptions and changes. Um, we're going to see the same hold true in uh, health and medicine and manufacturing. We're going to go from an era of scarcity that we live in today to one of amazing abundance in only in the next 10 years when we can manufacture everything we need from our solar panels to our furniture, our refrigerators, our computers, even food sources. We know today we can produce, uh, print out violins that play, airplanes that piece together that fly. Soon we'll produce um, our food sources and so on and so forth. So when the skills come down to near zero and the cost comes down to near zero, for what we can manufacture, we need to educate our kids in a new way. And we need to teach them. And as a society, we need to understand that the idea is what's going to reign supreme in this idea economy. So education is also, believe it or not, an information technology. And I'm here not to frighten you about that, but just to let you know that this is, technology has always been around to allow us to extend our reach, to amplify who we are, we've been doing that for the last 100,000 years since we first picked up that first stone and tied it to a rock to, or tied it to a branch to extend our reach. And um, we can do that as we go forward. Um, we already see that uh, education has changed dramatically. Technology is highly democratizing and decentralizing. Universities just in the last 100 years used to be uh, these, they were hermetically sealed, they taught from up high. Um, they spoke in Greek or Latin to be able to actually keep ignorance without, with, outside their walls and to keep uh, knowledge in their walls to commodify the education experience. Today, our finest universities, our Ivy League universities, allow all their courseware to be available for free online to anyone in the world that has an internet connection. And more and more people in the world have internet connectivity. Even sub-Saharan Africa, we see almost a third of the population have access in some way to the internet. Not to put too fine a point on it, but a young girl with access to a smartphone in Africa today has access to more information than our US president did only 15 years ago. And that's how fast the world is changing. So I'll give you some real world applications as we are tethered to the cloud, as these devices are tethered to the cloud, these decentralized servers that exist around the country and around the world. Um, a teacher can take her group of students and she can give them a test. And in real time, she can determine who the best performer is 
uh, who is someone who needs uh, or is deficient in a particular subject, where the mean average is. She can pair the two opposites, and they can be study buddies at home despite geographical distances. And so this is going to allow us a treasure trove of information that's going to follow the student wherever they go in their educational career. And I call that the academic plum. And I think it's a more apt metaphor than the cum because just like in nature, when we want to create, uh, or nature wants to create a more well-rounded ripe plum, so too do teachers in our society want to create the most well-rounded students. So um, this brings in what I call the, the gamification of education. It's already underway. But when we see a little shrivel in the plum, and no one will want to see the plum shrivel, it'll be so evident to us, it'll be this virtual reality representation of a plum, what will happen is these AIs, along with the teachers, will submit apps that are coming on by the hundreds of thousands to uh, make up for the particular deficiency that that student has. It might be geography. Before she knows, a role-playing game appears on her computer, and she's not even aware that she's learning, but she's getting exactly what her plum requires. So, Ultimately, we're at a point here where the people in this room, we have an opportunity for the first time in our human's entire civilization is to pair students with the most powerful invention our humanity has ever created, which is a personal computer. And I believe that, uh, again, we'll see amazing returns, as in the law of accelerating returns, not just on the dollars that we've put into these inventions, but into the ideas that we'll share with our kids. And I thank you very much.